Mark 13, verse 14, goes something like this. So when you see the king, so kingdom, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let not him who is in the field go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. I'm just going to read uh, Matthew's version of this out of Matthew chapter 24. It says this. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, we're going to talk about that. Spoken of by Daniel, the prophet. Interesting. Jesus takes this opportunity to tell you about Daniel because Daniel is one of the most contested books in the Bible. He couldn't have possibly wrote it in his time. It had to predate him and it had to do all this and it had to be written later. And, you know, they go through all of these things. And uh, Jesus just says, hey, Daniel was my guy and he was my prophet and you should listen to him. Anyway, he says, when you see that abomination of desolation standing, and Matthew says, in the holy place, in the naos, in the holy of holies, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Interesting. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days were shortened. So Matthew adds... The abomination of desolation, whatever that is, is going to be standing in the holy of holies, in the naos. That presumes a last day's temple. That presumes Israel has to build a temple. It also presumes that Israel's going to be back in their land, which is happening. You know, 1948, they got their land back, the exact same piece of land. Um, it, it assumes a very... Jewish twist on things because it mentions things like the Sabbath. So it's a very Jewish, very Israel piece of the passage. In Isaiah 11, 11, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, from the isles of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So he says, here's this thing. So when you see... This is going to be something visible. This is going to be something physical. This is going to be in a certain place at a certain time. And we're supposed to let the reader understand. We're supposed to understand this. We're supposed to understand Daniel's prophecy. That's where Jesus pinpoints us. He says, go read Daniel. Read about this abomination of desolation. And you're going to find it five times in the Bible. You're going to find it in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. In Daniel 11, 31. In Daniel 12, 11. And then here in, here in Mark and there in Matthew that I just read. <clears throat> you will find this mention of the abomination of desolation or the abomination that causes desolation or makes desolate. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we get more information on what it's going to look like. And in Revelation 13, he 
he sketches it all out for us. This is how it's all going to work out. So this is the picture of the Antichrist and his coming and his reign on this earth. Antichrist is interesting because the only place, there's only two times in the Bible that word's used. And they're used by John, who was the last, you know, of the apostles. He wrote, you know, in, in about 90 AD. And he uses that word Antichrist. Literally, when you read through the Bible, there are 15 or 20 names for this guy. He's a last days world leader. That's what we need to know, right? When, when it says Antichrist, we're looking for a world leader, not a national leader, a world leader who fits the description of what the Bible tells us about. And that world leader is going to be ruling over a one world government. Now, we're headed that direction. I don't know if you've noticed that. We are headed that direction. They're trying to make our economy one, and they're doing really good. You know, when, when the Japanese market falls, our market falls. When, when our market goes up, everybody else's market goes up. They're, the one world economy is coming, and so is this one world government. It's, it's coming. You can fight all you want. God says it's coming. So, you know, hang on to that idea. When that, uh, you know, when... Jesus breaks that first seal in Revelation chapter 6 and that white horse rides out. That is the Antichrist. And he has the answers to all the world's problems. That's something you need to understand. You know, he's, he's called a man of peace. You know, he, he's on a white horse. He's got a white hat. He's coming to save us, you know, and that's the illusion of truth. That's the illusion, illusion of righteousness. He's riding out here. He's going to save us. But, you know, he's going to rule and reign over the world by war. And he's going to bring peace by war. So something to something to think about that. Our world is scheduled to be shaken. And shaken very hard. Great tribulation, it says. You know, troublesome times. There's going to be this very intense battle in the last days over the souls of men. A very intense battle. And some of that is beginning to happen already. You know? But uh, the world's going to be seeking after order. It's going to be seeking after some leader with the answers. It's going to be seeking after safety, you know. <laughs> Find us a place where we can dwell and be safe and, hey, we'll let you in. We'll, we'll do whatever it's going to do. And they're going to get to this point where they will do anything for peace. Now, it's interesting. You go over to Israel and you ask an Israeli, who is your Messiah? You know what their answer is? The one that allows us to build our temple on our temple mount. That's the setup. Guys, they're set up. They're just waiting for the Antichrist to show up because guess what he's going to do? He's going to come in with a seven-year peace plan and allow them to build their temple on the Temple Mount. Probably right next to that Dome of the Rock thing. So he comes, in, he comes on the scene as a man of peace. From Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this, for when, I, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains. Labor pains, isn't that interesting? We were just talking about labor pains a week or two ago, you know. Upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So this guy is going to show up. He's a charismatic guy. He's got all the answers. He, he knows everything that's going on, and he has an answer for all of the world's problems. Imagine that. Our leaders today don't have any answers. This guy's going to have all the answers. And he's going to create this seven-year peace treaty in the Middle East. Oh, man. We can put, you know, the Middle East to bed. There's peace. How would that be, you know? But in the middle of that seven years, in three and a half years in, he brings destruction. He's actually going to come in 
and stop Israel from worshiping at that new temple. He's going to cease the, the offerings and the oblations that are going on there. He's going to go into the Holy of Holies himself and sit there and proclaim himself that he is God and he is to be worshipped. There's this place called the Temple Institute in Israel right now. Look them up on the internet. The Temple Institute. And they are preparing for that temple. They have the priest's robes. They have built the menorah. They've built all the fire pans and all the wick trimmers and all of the things. They, they have 80 or 90% of everything you need to hold that service. They're just waiting for the opportunity to step out there and put the foundation stone down and go for it. They even have the design. We, we looked at the design when we were there. They have a little rock model of it sitting there. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to work out. So this guy's going to be an economic genius. He's going to be a military genius. You know, he's going to be an administration and a, a religious genius and a great speaker, orator. He's going to be what everybody wants. Man, this guy, everybody, you know, we get somebody that, that's half on the ball and people are jumping up. Oh, man, that guy. He's going to take the division out and everybody's going to go, that's the guy. That's the guy. He has a false prophet that works with him. They're going to set up that image. He's going to go into the Holy of Holies. He's going to proclaim himself that he is God, that he needs to be worshipped. And then him and his false prophet are going to set up an image. Some idol. In the Holy of Holies. You know, the only reason this temple's being built is for this guy. It's not to be built to be a holy temple. It's being built for this guy. <laughs> and they somehow give this image the power to come to life. You've got to think about that. This image supernaturally comes to life. And the whole world, it says is in awe of this guy. He, they're in wonder about this guy. Man, that guy's amazing. Look at all the things he can do. The idol that they set up there is the abomination that causes the whole thing to be desolate, that causes, you know, God's, God can't be there. You know, it's, it's desolation. It brings this desolate thing. So, our world today is being desensitized towards this guy. Let me tell you how. You watch any Marvel movies, Caleb? All you guys, Wonder Woman, you know, the Black Panther, you know. All of these, all of these half normal people, but they have some supernatural characteristics. You know, and we watch those shows, they're quite entertaining, right? Pretty cool. You know, Batman's the only bummer. You know, he doesn't really have superpowers. He's just got billions of dollars, you know, so. <laughs> but um, here comes one who is that. He's physical. He's a human. But he's got supernatural powers. Do you think the world's going to accept that? Hey, this is, this is the movie come to life. Isn't it funny? We're going to be wide open to that. It's like eating cornflakes, you know. Oh, wonder what he's going to do today. Hey, these guys are getting out of line. Wonder what he's going to do over there, you know. And he's going to be that thing. I think our generation, this generation, wide open to a superhero like that. And that's, you know. It says, let him who read understand how important it is to know about this deceiver coming. You know, this guy, here's some of his names. He's called the Little Horn in Daniel chapter 7. He's called the Willful or Rebellious King in Daniel chapter 8 and 11. The Prince that is to come in Daniel chapter 9. The one who makes desolate Daniel chapter 9. 
the foolish shepherd in Zechariah 11, the man of destruction, the lawless one and the wicked one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the rider of the white horse, Revelation 6, and the beast, probably his most accurate name, the beast, Revelation 11, 13, and 19. Now think about this. Is this still future? Or has this already happened? Because there's all kinds of questions about this in our little world. John, who wrote 20 years after 70 AD, after Jerusalem was destroyed, 20 years after Titus Vespasian, 20 years after that, he says this, 1 John 2:18. little children, it is the last hour. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Notice that, is coming, still future. Even now, many Antichrists have come. That, that it is the last hour. By, by the fact that many Antichrists are, are around us, we know that we're living in the last days. And he says in 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar but he who denies Jesus Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So we look around and, and you can look at certain false teachers and you could go, that person has the spirit of Antichrist. You know, he's an instead of Christ or he's replacing Christ with something else or, you know, there's some twist to him. He's trying to wipe out the world or he's trying to wipe out Christians or he's trying to do all of these things. Um, Daniel says that this world, re this world leader will have no regard for the God of its fathers or for the desire of women. Now, some people read that and go, well, he's not religious and he's a homosexual. That is not what that says. It says he's... He... Uh, He has no regard for the God of his fathers. It tends to indicate that it's the God, the Elohim of his fathers. It tends to indicate that he's a Jew. Now think about this. Are the Jews going to accept a non-Jew as their Messiah? Ain't going to happen. So he's a Jew. He just doesn't regard God. He, he blows him off, you know. And then this idea of of the desire of women is what's the Jewish woman's desire to have the Messiah, to bring forth the Messiah. You see what he's doing here. He's denying the Father and the Son. He's denying the Father and the Son. He, that is Antichrist. That's what, that's what John just said. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. And so that's this guy's thing. But he gives himself over to the God of fortresses, the God of war. He's all about power and war. So when is this going to take place? Past, present, future, you know, because some say back in, you know, 167 BC that Antiochus Epiphanes, he was this ruler in the area of Judea who came in and he went into the Temple Mount and he slaughtered a pig and roasted it on the altar, sacrificed it on the altar. That, that's profane. He forced priests to drink that pig's blood. That's unholy, that, it's unclean, you know, you can't do that. And he actually put a big frying pan on top of the altar and burned or fried priests, you know, the first friars were right there, you know, kind of thing. And uh, he put an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. That is, you know, some say that's when it happened. Unfortunately, they haven't read the Bible. In Thessalonians, it's still future. In John's writing, it's still future. What that guy was, was a picture of exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. He's a type. He had the spirit of Antichrist, but he wasn't Antichrist. You know how you know that? 
because it says Christ will destroy him with the brightness of his being when he returns. Him and the Antichrist meet face to face when, G when Christ returns. Did Christ return in 167 BC? No. No, I, I think we'd have known that. Others say it was Titus Vespasian, this Roman guy who, who took the legions of Rome and went in in 70 AD and wiped out Jerusalem. And the trouble, there's lots of problems with that because, you know, Titus wasn't there when they actually took Jerusalem. Titus wasn't there when they burnt down the temple and when they, when they did all these things. So, you know, there was no sacrifice. There was no Holy of Holies anymore. There, there was no all of these things that had to happen. They, they didn't happen then, you know. Others say, well, Nero was the Antichrist because, well, if you, if you take his name, it's actually 666, you know, and you get into all of these things. Well, you know, you go through Ronald Reagan's name. He's, he's got that middle name and it's 666 and they tell you, hey, he was the Antichrist and hey, it was Jimmy Carter or it was one of the Bushes, you know, and, and we get all of these things. Wait a minute. This guy's got to come out of Europe. He's got to come out of a revised Roman empire whatever that looks like it could be the eu but he's got to come out of that area you know and here's the problem here's the other thing note the context this is in a time of the greatest tribulation ever to be known on planet earth is that happening today it's hard times but is it the hardest times? I mean, we've been through world wars, right? In the middle of France, in World War II, there was great tribulation. Lots of bad stuff going on. People dying and, and uh, just murder and death and stuff everywhere, right? And Jesus just looks you square in the face and he says, that was nothing compared to what this is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That should get your attention, right? So, you know, if you'll turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's just look at a passage here. You, you guys all know where the tea books are, right? It's after uh, the tea books. Thessalonians, Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's start at verse 3. Everybody there? Okay. It goes like this. Let no one deceive you by any means. Paul is talking to this church, and he only spent three weeks at this church. This is something you've got to understand. What was he teaching early church? <laughs> Listen. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There's going to be a falling away of believers, a falling away of the church. There's going to be, you know, the church is it's going to look like it's shrinking, like it's being depleted. Don't look around the world. Don't do it. It's bad news, right? There's going to be a falling away first, and the man of sin is revealed, and then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is talking about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. Notice that? Anything that anybody worships or anybody calls God, he is against that. And he exalts himself above that. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, that can only happen in one place. There's only one temple of God. We don't have one right now, but, you know, there can only be one, right? Showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There are antichrists and anti-Christian stuff and stuff everywhere already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. He who now restrains 
He who now restrains. Is your he capitalized? It's my personal opinion. You don't have to have this one. Personal opinion, that is the Holy Spirit working through the church. And we are the restraining force on this world. How many people have you ever run across? Don't give me your morals. We don't want anything to do with your morality and your standards and your righteousness. And that, just the fact that they know there's a difference, we're restraining this world from going crazy, from doing everything that it wants to do. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way is a bad translation. It's sort of right. Until he takes himself out of the way. Rapture. At the rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit's job is transformed. We are transformed. We're caught up into heaven, right? But the Holy Spirit's job, it's not like he leaves the planet, but he stops indwelling people and he goes back to the Old Testament style where he comes alongside of people. It's like having a buddy beside you telling you what to do or having someone inside you directing you what to do. A huge difference. They are not saved into the church. They are saved just like Old Testament believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in the Lamb of God. They believe the prophets. They believe that stuff. But they're not members. You know, they're even called their own group in Revelation. They're called the tribulation saints. They're still saints. They're still saved. Different group. They're not the bride of Christ. They're not his church. Different promises, different, you know, things. It's like there's always Old Testament saints and New Testament saints and tribulation saints, apparently. Three different groups. Interesting. Old Testament saints were the wife of Jehovah. New Testament saints are the bride of Christ. Tribulation saints. Interesting. I don't know where to go with that, you know, just a different group. And it says, he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way or literally takes himself out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Notice that. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Should we be looking for the Antichrist? Not if I read this correctly. Because we're going to be gone before he can be revealed. We're going to be out of here. I'm kind of happy about that. And the farther we get into the story, you'll understand why, you know. So it says, whom the Lord will consume, this Antichrist, the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When they meet face to face, what's the battle? What's the battle? Poof. Oh, that guy just disappeared. Hmm. Guess he's over, you know. That was the battle. That's the battle between good and evil to God. Right? There is no battle for good and evil. No, the battle's right here for us. Here's the battle for good and evil, you know. But for God, there's no one like him. There's nothing else like him. He created, you know, he cooked Satan in a, in a little oven like a chocolate chip cookie. And now he's all scared of Satan. No, I don't think so. He's using Satan. And when he's done with Satan, he's going to put him away. So he's going to destroy with the brightness of his coming. Notice this. This walks you up to and reveals the Antichrist. And then immediately Jesus comes. While the Antichrist is still reigning and ruling, Jesus shows up. That hasn't happened yet in the history of the world. No, that's still future. So verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Now notice this, with all power. That's not dunamis. That's not the same power we get. That's with the, the authority of God behind him. That's, that's kind of scary. With all power, signs, right? Miracles. 
and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception <laughs> among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So there's all of these signs, lying wonders, there's all this miraculous work and it's wooing the whole world and the whole world is drawn to it. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. Did you hear that? They wouldn't read the Bible. They wouldn't believe in Jesus. That they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion. What are those strong delusions? All those miracles, all those powers that Satan is using there. That's, that's interesting to me, that they should believe the lie. It's literally the lie. This guy's right, and God's wrong. This guy's the Savior, not Jesus Christ. You know, here's the lie. But notice this. This guy is being restrained. He can't come to the forefront yet. Is he alive today? He might be. You're never going to know, you know. He's, we can't know. He's being hidden right now. And the ugly things that are happening on planet Earth, they are being restrained right now, too. I mean, Florida, the shooting today, right? 17 dead, 13 wounded, some idiot, you know, another one. That's restraint. Can you imagine the moment the church and the Holy Spirit leave? The restraining force now is off. Free to do whatever you want to do. I'm glad I'm leaving. If I could just say that. I believe we can't know him. We shouldn't be looking for the Antichrist anyway. We should be looking for Jesus Christ. Right? Even us old people. You know. We shouldn't be looking for the undertaker. We should be looking for the upper taker. You know. Lord, come get us. Come get us. I, I don't want to lay in a box somewhere. And I don't, I don't like the process of getting from where I am right now to the box. That's, uh, I just will not do that, you know. I'd like to just be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, you know. So uh, this is future, John tells us. And, you know, you want more information? Read Revelation 11. Read Revelation 13. And it walks you through these things. In Revelation 19, the, the Battle of Armageddon, some people call it the War of Armageddon. It, it always cracks me up. There's no battle at Armageddon. In Revelation 19, 19, it says, And I saw the beast, this Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies were gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, against Jesus and his return. So all the lights go out. Picture the scene around the world, and the only thing anybody in the world can see is they look up in the heavens, and here comes a rider on a white horse. And he's got his army behind him. And they're riding down. And I don't know if this takes days, you know, but it says every eye is going to see him. Everybody knows he's coming. And what do the armies of the world do? What does Antichrist and the armies of, let's all get together, let's mass our armies, and let's fight him. If we fight him, then we could keep this. <laughs> so they all gather together. Then the beast was captured. Was there a war? Was there a battle? You know? And with him, the false prophet who worked the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. There's the battle. Jesus returns, you, go over there. You, bye, you know. And anybody that doesn't like it, he just consumes with the brightness of his coming. <laughs> okay, you know. This is Antichrist. This is the same beast that Jesus deals with when he comes back, you know. But all these other Antichrists that people come up with, people imagine, you know are just foreshadowings of the real one. 
They're just imitations, you know, little pictures, little drawings. But to be biblical, this section has to be yet future. You know, you think about Joseph Stalin. He had the spirit of Antichrist. He was wiping out people left and right, trying to set up one world, one kingdom, you know. Adolf Hitler, you know, some 30 million people, you know, he's done away with. ISIS has the spirit of Antichrist, trying to wipe out Christians in the West, you know. But what, we've, what we need to understand is they're all being empowered by a spiritual force that is behind them. You know, Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, when you have a fight with your, with your brother or your sister or your, your nephew or your son or your, your mom about spiritual things, you're not actually fighting with that humanity. You're fighting with the spirit that is backing them because their spirit doesn't like what your spirit's telling them. And your spirit doesn't really like, you know, what their spirit is coming across as. You know, there's this, there's principalities, there's powers, there's rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There's all of these forces going on. And those spiritual forces influence people and their behavior. You don't think that's true. In Canada, you go to adopt a kid and you tell them you're Christian, they will not let you adopt a child. And they do not want that influence coming into their youth. You know, morality, Christianity, Jesus. They, they don't want that influence. <clears throat> they won't even allow focus on the family to broadcast there. You cannot, they, they have to set up translators 50 miles into America and shoot the trans, you know, transmit in there. In England, you can't broadcast on the radio the exclusivity of Christ. Jesus is the only way. Not allowed. You can go there and teach it. You can't preach it across the radio. You know, in the Roman Catholic Church, now it says that Mary is going to be the one, the divine figure that unites the world. Mary is going to be the divine figure. When did Mary become divine? Anybody? Well, she's the mother of God. No. She's the mother of Jesus physical part you know <laughs> you know she's the co-redemptress you can actually buy a, a uh, Catholic crucifix with Jesus on one side and Mary on the other that's the spirit of Antichrist the whole world's going crazy you know, in America, we're legalizing drugs everywhere. You know, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Colorado, Oregon, you know, all these places. We're legalizing drugs. You can't go supersize a soft drink because, oh, that's bad for you. Excuse me? You know, we're going to start making Coke cans just this big because we want to limit you. No, it's a stupid marketing ploy. I can still charge the same amount for this one as for that one, and it's half, you know. <laughs> Proverbs. Remember we started a couple weeks ago. And it, it's sin makes you stupid. And our world is walking down that road. <laughs> so what effect is it having? Well, let me... Let me warn you guys, you know, I know many believers, born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are afraid to take a stand today. They won't stand on the Bible. Man, if I tell them I'm a believer in the Bible, they're going to they're gonna crucify me at work, you know. I won't get, be able to get along with my family. Huh? You know, you start talking about uh, creation. What do you mean? You don't believe in science? I believe in everything in science. I do. There's not a single thing in science 
that's a provable scientific fact that I don't believe. I just believe that Jesus is behind it all, you know. Oh, do you mean do I believe in evolution the way you do? Absolutely not, because science doesn't believe that. And it can't prove it. And it can't repeat it. Matter of fact, scientists, science, if you just want to be strictly scientific, you can't prove you, period. You take an egg from your mom, sperm from your dad, put them together, it doesn't make you. It doesn't. You're a one-off. And anything that's a one-off can't be redone like that through science. Science is repetition. If we do this 20 times, this happens 20 times. Oh, that's science. Not, well, I think. No, that's philosophy. Don't get your words mixed up. You believe in philosophy, totally get it. Totally understand. It's cool, because I have my own philosophy. You know? You start talking about marriage between a man and a woman. Pfft. Not very popular. You know? What about transgender and what about all this other stuff? I, that's mental disease. Well, I just can't say that. I just did. You know, there's XX and there's XY and there is no third option there. What about disciplining, disciplining kids or what about morality? What about responsibility? You know, personal responsibility. What about witnessing? I know Christians who, who won't step out because they got their toes stepped on. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be different. I don't want to take the heat. Sorry, that's why we're here. You know, in Matthew 7, 14, it says this. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Therefore, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go that way. And he says, take the difficult way. Go to the narrow way. Go that way. Because it's hard now, but there's rewards then. You know? Revelation 13, 6. Talking about the Antichrist again. It says, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. And then he adds this, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Man, he's warning us. Take heed, watch out. There's a counterfeit coming, and the whole world's going to run that direction. The whole world is going to start to blaspheme the name of God. The whole world is going to blaspheme his tabernacle, his house, his people. Interesting, isn't it? We're living in those days. So in verse 14, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, right there in the Holy of Holies, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He's gonna start dealing with this very Jewish scene. If the church is gone, it's very Jewish, right? That's who he's talking to, the Jews. He, he's gonna talk about this thing in the holy place inside a rebuilt temple somewhere and he says when you see that run for the hills the natural thing for people to do in war especially in a, in a place like Jerusalem was to run into the city walls you're safer inside the city walls and Jesus says don't make that mistake run for the hills head for the hills you're not going to have much time let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house nor enter to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. And then some woes. But oh, those poor people who are pregnant or who are nursing babies in those days. Can you imagine? You don't have time. You just have to run. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. And Matthew adds or on the Sabbath. 
because a practicing Jew, they'd be sitting there questioning, can I run that far? Can I go that far? Because I can only walk so far on a Sabbath, you know, and I can't work up a sweat or I can't. He says, man, drop all of that religious nonsense and get out of Dodge. So where is the church? Has it been raptured? It's a good question, isn't it? You know, people ask me all the time, well, Mark, the church has always gone through tribulation. You know, Jesus has even promised it. He says, if you're down here on this planet, you will have tribulation. So why do you think we're going to escape tribulation in the last days? Why do you think this rapture has to happen before this tribulation? And, you know, in my opinion, you got the question backwards. Because it's, it's all about the source of tribulation. Jesus warns us, in this world you will have tribulation. Why? Because the tribulation is coming from the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what causes all of our problems on planet Earth today. It's either something the world's doing, it's something in me, my flesh, you know, my fallen nature, or it's Satan messing with us. That's the source of all tribulation in this world. But this great tribulation that's coming, its source is God pouring out his holy wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. The source is totally wrong. The source is no longer the world, the flesh, and the devil. The source is God himself. And no generation of the church has ever gone through the wrath of God. Why would the last generation of the church? So here's, here's the thing. Read your Bible. Study it. We are delivered from wrath, from God's wrath. We have been delivered. Why? Because Christ took that wrath for us on the cross. We can never go through the wrath of God, ever. He already took it for us. It would be double jeopardy for him to put us in that position, and he will not put us in that position. He says, there will be a time, notice verse 19, in those days there will be tribulation. Matthew uses the word great. Great tribulation such has never been on this created world. And he mentions creation twice there, which is very interesting. Apparently Jesus is a creationist, I don't know. Great tribulation. I don't want to be here. You? You want to sign up and go, yeah, I'd like to walk a few miles down that path. That'd be kind of interesting, you know. I've got my M16. Let's see what happens, you know. I, I don't want to be here. And you know what? I won't be here. According to the Bible, I mean, in this same passage in Luke, Luke 21, 36, it says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. How are you counted worthy? You're a believer. I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I trust him. You're now counted worthy, right? Not your worthiness, his. His righteousness is now accounted to your account Because the cause of this great tribulation, God's wrath. When you, when you read about the tribulation saints, those who are saved after we're taken out and that seven years of tribulation begins, they're, they're, they're not counted. It says it's uncountable, the number of believers that come to believe. You know, in that time, there's 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams and they are sharing Christ and people are getting saved all over the place, and it's costing them their lives. You don't bow down to this beast, you don't bow down to this altar, then we take your head off. You don't get your little 666 on your head or on your forehead or whatever. We, we cut your head off. Interesting that that's a Muslim technique, by the way. Interesting. But 
Um, it says the number that gets saved in that time period is without number. I have billions of them. Why doesn't God just go, I'm done? Because there's billions to be saved. Right? So in verse 20, and it says, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened those days. If Jesus did not return at the end of this tribulation period, scorched earth policy, not a single life left. And then he says, take heed, because I've told you this before it's come to pass. <laughs> there will be an antichrist. There will be a deceiver, a counterfeit, and instead of Christ. And he's a phony. Watch out for this guy. He will come with lying signs and wonders and all deception. You know, it's interesting in Isaiah, it says that Isaiah or that Israel will make a covenant with death and hell. Because here comes this guy riding in on his white horse and giving peace to the region and allowing them to build their temple and they're going to accept him. They're going to make a covenant with him, a peace treaty with him. Jesus said in John 5, 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. When this guy rides in, in his own name, they're just going to go, that's the guy. That's our Messiah, you know. I have told you beforehand as a warning. Be alert. Know what's going on. Be ready. Do we really have to know this? No, but we really need to share this. Because there are going to be some people left that need to hear this. <laughs> are you watching? Are you aware? Are you on the lookout? And are you sharing? You know, Second Thessalonians 2, 9 again. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. All signs, lying wonders, all unrighteous deception. That's a lot of all, isn't it? All, all, all. He's coming with everything. All of his guns blazing. Among those who perish or among those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. Because they call your love hate right now, don't they? They call your love obnoxious. That they might be saved. You know, until this Antichrist arrives, God is offering salvation to any and all who wish to partake of it. The door's wide open. It's our place. We must be bold enough not to love people to hell. Well, I love them. I don't really want to stir up trouble. But are they saved? Or do I still need to share? You know? Don't let political correctness shut your mouth. God's challenging us. You know, stand up. Share and care for others until I come. What did he leave us with? The Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, you know. And the other thing, love me, love them. I know they're unlovable. Love them anyway. Go tell my story. Go be my ambassadors. But many, many in our day, I watch it all the time, are getting their little feel-goods hurt. They go, man, I stepped out and... That guy was a jerk. I, I'm not going to do that again. Wrong answer. You know, Matthew 24, 11, same passage. Matthew 24, 11, it says, 
then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures, he who puts through it, pushes through it. It's not the pushing through that saves you. No, you're pushing through to prove that you're saved. You're pushing through because you're saved. Yeah, it's going to get ugly. Yeah, it's going to get hard. Yeah, you're going to lose some friends. You probably don't have any anyway, you know, kind of like me. I get on Facebook and I look at all these names and I was like, I don't know any of these guys. I don't know what's going on here, you know. It's, it's time to take personal inventory. Are we cold? Are we growing cold? Because it's getting harder. Because it's, you're getting your feel good stepped on. Here's, here's Jesus. Don't let the world shut you down. I've lit you up. I've fanned the flame. You stand for me. You stand on my ground, you know. When he comes again, I want to be found doing his good pleasure. <laughs> you know, I, I want to hear that. Well done, good and faithful servant. Right now it's, well, <laughs> nice try, Mark, you know. Uh, I want to hear well done, you know. I, I want to eliminate from my life, well, I got hurt. That was mean, you know. Never again will I do that. No, no, no. God lives in us. He empowers us. He strengthens us. He motivates us. And he directs us. And most of the time, all we have to do is start to do this. If we'll just start to talk, he'll lead that conversation. Doesn't mean the guy's going to get saved. Just means truth got out there. And that's our job. Scatter and seed. It's not my job if it comes up. It's not my job. That's God's job. My job is to share. My job is to be a listening ear. My job is to care. Lord, there are times where we feel overwhelmed, outgunned and outnumbered and just overwhelmed. And yet, Lord, you and me you and us make a majority in any crowd. You have more power, more authority, more of everything that we need. And so, Lord, would we just humble ourselves before you and say, Lord, we can't, but you can. And then, Lord, would we act correctly, Lord? Would we pray like everything depends on you and Lord would we work like everything depends upon us